Okay, so I'm going to just, re we're just going to review like one page today from what we did last time because we're, as we continue to zip through the book. So 76, it says, turning from evil and doing good. This is a quote from both, from two different Tehillim, Tehillim 34 and Tehillim 37, Lamed Dalit and Lamed Zion. It says, Sor me ra tov. And we're going to speak about three levels of what that means. And that's how we're going to see what then and how it fits in with Hachna Ahav Dalaham Takam. So, three levels of what it means turning from evil and doing good. All right, so I'm just going to read from uh, bits from these paragraphs. So, the Torah's fundamental attitude toward good and evil is summarized in the verse depart from evil and do good. See, very simply, we can understand it. He says, this is disarmingly self-evident. And this different understanding of how we may rid ourselves of our inner evil. And just to review on using that e the word evil, which is a strong word that we spoke about many times, the three levels of evil. One is what the Torah says we shouldn't do and are wanting to do it. I don't know why I always smile when I say that there's something, isn't that whimsical? The Torah says we shouldn't do it and we want to do it. I'm crying and laughing at the same time. Don't get me wrong. So that's the first level. The second level of evil is psychological complexes that cripple us from doing our shlichas. And, and that's very personal. And then the most personal of all of evil, the most subtle definition is whatever embitters our life. And we're gonna learn how to sweeten what embitters our life. Okay, so how we can rid ourselves of our inner evil. So um, then this, the first of the three, it's the second paragraph here. The simple interpretation of this phrase is that we must depart from evil before we can hope to do good. Self-refinement and a relationship with Hashem must be based on renunciation of all wrongful behavior, speech, and thinking, action, speech, and thought renunciation of it. And that's that's the moment of tshuva. That's the moment of tshuva. And we can experience it. It's hard to hold it, but at least to experience it for a moment. Of course, we sweep out the dirt before we bring in the, sh the Shabbos decorations. Before we set the table, we sweep out the dirt. So it's a simple mushal. Of course, the next to the last paragraph, it is true, of course, that the Torah obligates us to fulfill its active mitzvahs to do good, whether or not we have fully departed from evil. I mean, that's, that's you know, we have to start doing mitzvahs. We can't wait till I'm at Sadek. We start doing mitzvahs now. That's the idea of, you know, asking someone to light Shabbos candles, you know, even if whatever they're gonna do afterwards, but to start doing good. Okay. So, and the Baal, so the bottom paragraph, the Baal Shem Tov points out that this attitude becomes subdued as we climb the ladder of spiritual growth, but is never entirely lost. He explains the verse, and there's a quote here from Kohelis. There is no righteous person on earth who does good and does not sin. So when I was um, thinking about this Kohelis, so that it reminded me of, there's a Hasidic song that I saw that Avram Fried attributed to the Baal Shem Tov, a Hasidic nigan, Ashrei mi shelo chata. Two lines, happy is the one who doesn't sin. Umi shechata yashuv yashuv. And he who sins should do tshuva v'yim chalo, and he'll be forgiven. It's actually taken from Gemara Sukkah, page 53. I had never realized this. It begins elu v'elu. There, these, there are two different opinions that go before this. But Elu Elu, they all agree. Ashrei mi shelo chata, happy is the person that doesn't sin. Umi shechata yashuv yashuv. I, I, this, this is um, very popular about the young men at our Shabbos table like to sing this niggin. I'm just going to play one minute of it so you can get um, the idea. We can get into the right mood that Hasidic niggin gets us. In, and if you know the words, you can sing along. It's about to appear. On my, here it is. 
No, let me get it back to the right. Okay. And it actually was repeated for seven minutes. It is beautiful and it's very moving and reminds us that we can always do tshuva. Okay, so the top of 77, to mean that every act of good is tainted with some element of sin, at the very least with some unwarranted pride in having done good. Okay, so this is what we're going to speak about. This has to be very clear. I mean, this is, this is like basic first year Torah Sanefish. And again, we have to be, you know, I have a note, a note on the side. People who don't feel better than other people are happier people. So the idea, okay, keep that thought in mind. So the idea of when we do good, and when you, when I remember when I first heard this t- 10 years ago in Taurus and Epish, it seemed like revolutionary. I never would have thought of it. It's that when we do good, we have to give Hashem credit for the good that we do and not let the ego inflate. Because if the ego inflates, which means the ego is feeling better than other people, it will have to eventually crash, which can be painful because in truth, Hasidus teaches we're not better than other people. So how to avoid that unpleasant inflation and crash is to give Hashem credit for the good that we do. And this is like, if we haven't thought about it before, it seems like a very novel idea. We give Hashem credit for the energy to do the good. We give Hashem credit for the situation that he put in front of us. We give Hashem credit, and this is the most subtle, for the motivation to do good. Because the motivation to do good is the most subtle of the three. It's like when we look for chumets only in in its cracks and crevices. It doesn't say look for chumets in the middle of the room. But the cracks and crevices is taking credit for the motivation to do good. So we have to give that to Hashem also. So we give Hashem credit for the good that we do, and then our good is not tainted with ego. Now, just to review, the bad we do, chas v'shalem, we take total responsibility for, because this also helps us not feel better than other people, which is also a revolutionary idea. I'm using the bad I, the bad I did in a positive way. I'm using it to help me in my humility. It's really like a brilliant idea. So the the good we give Hashem credit for, the bad I use in a positive way to help remind me that I'm not better than other people. We spoke about Uri Kaplun's mashal of the far-sighted person. He can't read if it's here and he can't read if it's here. He can only read if it's the exact right distance. And that's that's the Hatasi Lenekti Samid. My sin is in front of me, but if it's too close, I can drive myself crazy. Why did I do that? How did I do that? Why did that happen to me? Or if it's too far, we could start to think we're better than other people. So we hold the sin just at the right, the right distance. I like that. Okay, so we're using the good and the bad to help us get closer to Hashem. Okay, so thus, the top of 77, even while doing good, we must depart from evil. That is, we must bear in mind the innate egocentricity of our animal soul. This keeps our ego from becoming inflated over the good that we do. In other words, the ego will, due to its innate egocentricity, you would expect an ego to have egocentricity. It's no surprise. But um, so we don't want to let the ego get inflated by the good that we do. We give Hashem credit for the good that we do. Yes, a deeper understanding. Oh, now, okay. So that's level one. That's all hachna'ah. 
Now we're moving on to the second level of Sorme Rava Asetov. A deeper understanding of depart from evil and do good is that depart from evil means ignore evil. That is, and that's from Lakute Sikha's volume one, that's from the Rebbe. Depart from evil means ignore evil. That is, do not allow evil to get in the way of doing good. Rather, rely on the good to overcome and, er and eradicate the evil. When we simply do a little extra good, we find that even a little light will dispel a great deal of darkness, which is from Kohelis. Kovos Levavo speaks about it in, Ch in Tanya chapter 12, the Alter Rebbe speaks about it, adding a little bit of good, a little bit more good. Ignore the evil. Let's not think about it. Let's just do a little more good. That's level two. Now, level three is from the Baal Shem Tov, the middle of the page, 77. The Baal Shem Tov offers a third. This is, by the way, new material. This is what we, this is we got up to last time. Up to this, this is the exciting part. The Baal Shem Tov offers a third, even deeper interpretation of this phrase. He reads the words and do good as make the evil itself good. Because this is very interesting. In Hebrew, ase tov, it says do good. Ase also is the, is the word for make. make. Make the evil good. So what does this mean? So let's talk about first this idea that the same word, ase, means both do and make. This is the famous line that the kosher wife does her husband's will, I say. Now, that's when his will is the right will. Why not do the right thing? Now, when his will is the wrong will, I say, she makes his will. She makes his will the right will. Now, this is a little more psychologically taxing <laughs> because the sledgehammer <laughs> attempt is not always so successful as people might note but it takes deep psychology, deep psychological understanding of the true nature of the mind and reality to make his will the right will. But this is what the kosher wife does. She does her husband's will when it's the right will and she makes his will the right will when it's not. So this is the same use of, of it. We're saying so turn from evil and make it good, make the evil good. Let's see what the Baal Shem Tov says on this. Okay, so to make the evil itself good, the ultimate way to get rid of inner evil is to reveal its inner kernel of good, its innate spark of divinity, which when revealed provides us with the power to transform the evil itself into good. And then this is a direct quote from Kester Shem Tov, from the Baal Shem Tov. Let me read that sentence again. The ultimate way to get rid of inner evil is to reveal its inner kernel of good, its innate spark of divinity, which when revealed, provides us with the power to transform the evil itself into good. As we have seen, this is the culmination of the Kabbalah therapeutic process. So there's different levels of what that means and different personal things. What does it mean that the, to transform the evil itself into good? So one way, the simplest way that I understand it is to, to use what embitters our, our life to spur us on to spiritual growth, to let those things be what spurs us on, that we want to move, we want to grow, we want to change, we don't want to stagnate. Okay, there's a couple of footnotes that I circled here, back all the way back for on one... 167, ah, 167. So we'll start with footnote 22. Did we get up to that yet? No, okay, we're gonna wait for footnote 27. 20, okay, let us continue inside. Okay, so, so the, the, the Baal Shem Tov gave us this third, even deeper interpretation to, to make the bad good, to use it for something good. If we become deeper people and less judgmental people and more compassionate people because of whatever embittered our lives, then Baruch Hashem, we've used it to spur ourselves on to grow. 
So let's look at the chart here. The chart here on page 77 is quite useful. So the, starting from one, submission, hachna'a, depart from evil before doing good. In other words, note what's, what, what, what's evil in our lives, what embitters our life, and, and, do the, and, that, and focus on that. Focus on departing from those things. Number two is separation, habdala. Depart from evil by ignoring it and doing additional good. Ignoring the evil by ignoring it and doing additional good. Depart from evil by ignoring it and doing additional good. So that's not focusing on how I have to change, but it's focusing on what good things I can do. And the sweetening, hamtaka, is depart from evil by making it good. That's a real sweetening. Then the evil itself is something that I'm using to grow and change. And we have to, again, be aware when we're doing this that we're being empowered by Hashem. We can daven for him to help us. And we're being empowered by the Baal Shem Tov. And we're being empowered by each other at this lovely Fabringen. We have 29 people. So exciting. Could, could a few more people put on their cameras, please? I need that humor. I know it's hard to be in public. <laughs> it is kind of being right there in public with the masses, but it's so nice. It makes, makes I guess, gives me air. It gives me oxygen. I can think of my more innovations. Okay, thank you. So at the bottom of the page, even in the sweetening stage, the objective of turning the evil into good is accomplished by doing good. Doing good is a big emphasis. We have to be inspired to do, do good. Now that's, that sounds like fun, doing good. Once we have mentally isolated the kernel of good within the evil, we must actualize it by altering our behavior patterns. So those are the kind of things that always make me smile. We have to actualize it by Altering our behavior patterns. Now, is that <laughs> is that a blow? It, it is a little. It is a little bit because altering our behavior patterns does require some growth and change to manifest this inner good and thereby gain the power to transform the evil itself into good. So again, we're getting an empowerment by learning this. We're being empowered to be able to do it. It's not. It's more than just our own efforts. We're davening to Hashem that we should alter our behavior patterns. Everyone is probably can sign up. Why not? Okay, now it's footnote 22 on the bottom of page 167. Since this is a departure from our habitual pattern of behavior, it requires extra effort. Let's make L'chaim to be inspired to make that extra effort. L'chaim, L'chaim. The effort required to break the mold is the super good, alluded to by the word ma'od, might, in the verse, v'hafta es Hashem elokecha v'chol levavcha v'chol nafshecha v'chol miodecha, that word at the end, ma'od. You shall love God your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your ma'od, <clears throat> which is sometimes translated as might, but... The Hebrew word miodecha literally means you're very much. Ma'od is very. Doing good this way is a Mashiach mode of action and that it liberates and redeems us from our accustomed level of existence. So to put in a little more ma'od, a little more effort in our doing good, that means we're, al we're altering our behavior patterns to do a little more good. It's interesting when I, when I was just meditating on that at this very moment, I thought of this uh, physical therapist that I saw and she told me exercises to do and she was watching me on Zoom and she kept on asking me, how much effort am I putting in? And I never really you know, <laughs> thought of that question of judging the amount of effort I put in, but it struck me as such a revolutionary idea. When we're trying to learn something, when we're trying to do something, take me one second, Mayor, if you could, I can hear it. Please don't, please don't do that now. Thank you. 
Oh, see that? I made my husband's will. <laughs> He's laughing. That's lucky. Yes. Good, good. So um, back to mi uh So that extra effort, putting putting in the extra effort, like it's just, it's an interesting question. I've been asking myself and other things. How much effort am I, what, from one to 10, how much effort am I putting in? So whatever effort we're putting into doing good, this is supposed to inspire us, oh, to put in more effort, very effort, put in a little, very more good effort. And that alters our behavior patterns. And we're being empowered to do that. Yes, okay, so that was good. We did, and we did footnote 22. So that brings us to a new, a new little subtitle here, Unmasking the Illusion. This is very interesting. On page 78, the power darkness possesses over us is the power of illusion. Listen to this. Intelligent people do not intentionally harm themselves, right? We, we don't intentionally harm ourselves. Only when we imagine that a particular negative action will not really harm us, or it will do so only temporarily, or the advantages it brings will outweigh the damage, do we engage in wrongdoing? It's a very interesting sentence. We don't really, we wouldn't want to harm ourselves. So the only reason we'll do some negative action is that we believe it really won't harm us, or it'll only harm us temporarily, or the advantages it brings will outweigh the damage. So this is, um, so he continues, in the majority of cases, evil succeeds because we delude ourselves into thinking that it is in our best interest to succumb to its temptations. It deludes us into thinking that it's in our best interest to succumb to its temptations. Yeah, so it's something to think about. It reminds me of what we've learned previously, that famous um, Yalkut Shimoni, the Medrash, that, that the, the like youth wants to know, Hota Ma Ansho, the sinner, what is his punishment? The sin, and this question, the sinner, what is his punishment, is asked to four different levels of consciousness, to wisdom, to Navua, to prophecy, to the Torah, and to Hashem himself. The punish, what the the sinner? What is his punishment? Because you could see it's normal, but we might want to know that if it's a juicy sin and a mild punishment, you know, we could think it's in our best interest. Chas v'shalom. Only kidding. So the sinner, what is his pun? What is its punishment? So this is. So we think we think that the the advantages the advantages it'll bring will outweigh the damage. That's the only way we would engage in wrongdoing. And we delude ourselves that it's in our best interest to succumb to temptation. The pleasure that often accompanies wrongdoing presents a false promise of a sublime uplifting. We become convinced will improve our lives immeasurably. We're just really looking for a sublime uplifting. But afterwards reality hits and we have to admit to our chagrin, we were duped. We were duped by our Yetzirah. The enticement was a ruse, the lift only momentary, and in its wake, we feel shame and betrayed. We betrayed our godly soul. So the evil only succeeds because we delude ourselves into thinking it's in our best interest. And then we feel bad. Okay, so bottom paragraph on 78, there are two ways to react to such an awakening. We can resolve never to make the mistake again. The fear of betraying God and the godliness within ourselves motivates us to identify and resist similar illusions. And that, you know, so we, and we have to, the thing is to pull, our, pull, pull ourselves up again. We could make that resolution never to make the same mistake again. And we could make the same mistake again. So when that happens, we have to again make the resolution. We can't, we have to keep, we have to be hopeful that you just never know when we'll really be inspired to not make that same mistake again. Because we don't want to betray God and our godly soul. 
now that we've risen to a level of consciousness at which it is clear that our previous failings were the result of being fooled, we have retroactively transformed these previous intentional transgressions into unintentional ones. So I want to speak about this. This is actually a quote from Gomorrah Yuma 86b. It's quoted, the Alter Rebbe quotes it in Agera Sachuva. And it's a basic idea in the Gomorrah that if we do tshuva out of fear of punishment, which is the lowest level of tshuva, it's better to do it out of fear of sin, wanting to be separate from Hashem. But if we do tshuva at any level, we did in the past, maze it intentionally becomes redefined as shogeg, a mistake. Because if I knew then what I know now, I never would have done it. I just didn't know then what I know now. But now that I do, I can redefine. It becomes redefined. It becomes, and it's interesting, the words are, we have retroactively transformed these previous intentional transgressions into mistakes. Retroactively is, is I think, a key word, because it means we can affect the past. We can change the, through tshuva, we can change the past, that what was an intentional transgression becomes a mistake. Isn't that a good thing? Yes. And we've also spoken about how, you know, we do tshuva out of love, though it's, this is not what it's speaking about here. If we do tshuva out of love, then, then they become mitzvahs. And that's the idea of them spurring us on to become less judgmental people and more compassionate people. Bottom line, the only reason we transgress then is because we were operating under an illusion. Had we known then what we know now, we never would have done what we did. Again, Yuma 86b, if we had known then what we, knew now, what we know now. So now we know. And it's a very good thing to be able to affect the past. It's a, to retroactively change the past, that it becomes a mistake. It was just a mistake. I didn't know. That what a benefit of tshuva. Yashuv, yashuv. Umisha chata yashuv, yashuv, ayim chalo. And he'll be forgiven. It's a great nigan. Was it caused by a promise of some thrill? some rush of exuberance that is sorely missing from our lives. Perhaps we despaired of finding pleasure, exuberance, and self-fulfillment in holy ways. So that's, um, that's very tough. We certainly don't want to give over a Yiddish kite that a child can, should, God forbid, feel this way, the despair of finding pleasure and self-fulfillment in holy ways. Oh, yeah, yeah, right. So this is something very, very important in Chinuch, that give over that, giving mitz, doing mitzvahs, that one can find great joy and pleasure and exuberance. And so we have to demonstrate this to our children. The joy of the pleasure, the exuberance, and the self-fulfillment in holy ways. Because people transgress because they despaired of finding pleasure in holy things. We, we may have even thought that it was somehow illegitimate or irreverent to seek such experience, such experiences in the context of a spiritual life. So th that was, you know, this idea that, you know, before the Baal Shem Tov, there were people that felt that if you were a from person, you had to have like a little bit of a frown on your face, that that showed that you were a serious person. You are a serious from person. Life was tough. It's not the Ga'ul yet. How it's smiling was considered very frivolous, and one should have a slight frown. You might have seen, I always remember there's a picture of Simcha's Torah, like before the time of the Baal Shem Tov, and they have all the Torahs out, and they're holding them, and they're walking, like with a very, very blue, depressed expression on their face. It's a famous picture. It looks like Tisha B'Av, a very tough. <laughs> Simcha's Torah, because people felt that it was somehow illegitimate or irreverent to seek pleasure, exuberance, and, and self-fulfillment in a spiritual life. So, Baruch Hashem, the Baal Shem Tov came, and we know that it can be lots of fun doing mitzvahs. Okay, I want to look at another footnote. 
And that's on the top of 168, footnote 24. So it's a quote from the Sagachova Rebbe, who passed away in 1910, Rabbi Avraham Bornstein of Sachachov. He explains that it is a mistake to think that it is illegitimate to enjoy the performance of mitzvahs. It's a mistake to think that it's illegitimate. People thought that, that you shouldn't enjoy the performance of mitzvahs especially that of learning Torah and revealing new insights into its meaning. So that should be filled with pleasure. Learning Torah should be filled with pleasure, and especially the fun part of revealing new insights into its meaning, which we will do when we bring about these ideas. Okay. Um, mm, mm, mm. The ultimate study of the Torah for its own sake is to study knowing that such is the will of Hashem, together with the great experiencing great pleasure and satisfaction in one's learning and opportunity to innovate. It's a beautiful idea. We're supposed to really be creative in our learning as we're learning, to innovate new ways to describe it, new ways. Very exciting. So let's look at this slowly. To, to we learn Torah knowing that it's the will of God. Isn't that interesting? Like now we're learning Torah, we're learning the Torah of the Baal Shem Tov, of Rabbi Yitzhak Ginsberg. So this is the will of God when we're learning Torah. I'm very excited about that idea. We have to make a l'chaim, l'chaim, l'chaim. <coughs> Okay. So when we're, it's the will of God. It's not just like a Jewish custom. It's mamish, the will of God, learning Torah, doing mitzvahs. It's good to conform to Hashem's innermost will, connect with Hashem's innermost will. And so we know that such is the will of God, together with experiencing great pleasure and satisfaction in one's learning. So I want to make sure everyone's having a good time. Is everyone feeling I hope so. There's somebody waving their cup. Bracha, thank you. That's the idea. We want to see those happy faces learning and innovating Torah together with this lovely group of people. Yes. Okay, let's see. Is there anything more here by the Sachachov Rebbe? Even when we study Torah just for the, sp- the sake of experiencing pleasure, we have performed the mitzvah of learning Torah part. So, so that's it. So we have to, this is a great opportunity that we're together and we're learning. Okay, so that brings us uh, back to page 79. So here how, how this ends, the last sentence of this paragraph, the logical conclusion of such thinking is that pleasure can be achieved only through transgression. So thinking that that, that we can't find pleasure, exuberance, and self-fulfillment in holy ways, someone can conclude that pleasure is only achieved through transgression, which God forbid is not the message that we want to give to our students and our children. God forbid that somebody should reach, you know, that that's the Yiddishkeit that someone has presented to think that pleasure can only be achieved through transgression, right? And we have, so we have to, so we want to, we want to have pleasure. We want to have pleasure and exuberance and self-fulfillment through the mitzvahs, through learning, through for bringing, through, as Rabbi Jonathan Sachs said, writing this chapter of Jewish history. Right now we're writing a chapter of Jewish history. We're bringing, we want to make it conscious. Okay, now we have a little story. Who has the book? If, if people have the book, if you just hold it up for a moment so I can... Oh, look, there's a lot of book people here. All right, lovely. It's highly recommended for late night reading. Okay, so this is... I don't normally read the little stories that are here, but um, I'm just going to give this over. So this... So this person wants to do a lot of traveling and he's not traveling and he's depressed because he's not traveling. He wants to go traveling. Okay, so so the, um, so the third chapter, the third paragraph, beyond that there lies a legitimate need for a regular dose of stimulation and excitement that makes life interesting and challenging. Yes, I like that, a dose of stimulation and excitement. 
Hashem wants our lives to be both disciplined and inspired, regular and spontaneous. So that's a paradox. So we're supposed to be disciplined and inspired simultaneously. Now that's quite a cool idea. Disciplined and inspired. Discipline, it's a paradox, paradox of Jewish life. We spoke about the paradox of the, the, uh, the joy is on one side of my heart and weeping is on the other. This is what Rabbi Elazar, the son of Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai, he said this, I have joy, I have chedva on one side of my heart and weeping on the other side of my heart. When his father, Rabbi Shimon, told him the secrets of the destruction of the Beis Hamikdash, So he was weeping because he understood what it really meant that the Beis Hamikdash was destroyed. And he was, he was in joy because he was hearing the innermost deep secrets of the Torah. So the paradox of Jewish life. So here's another paradox. Hashem wants our lives to be both disciplined and inspired. Disciplined and inspired. Regular and spontaneous. So it's so interesting, these ideas. Like, like life is supposed to be really exciting, both disciplined and regular, and on the, on the other hand, inspired and spontaneous. So this person here who we're reading the story about has focused only on one side and neglected the other. So that could be very tough, just being disciplined without being inspired and spontaneous. So we have to, we have to bear this paradox. So he denies himself the excitement of letting his imagination take him to uncharted realms of his own personality or his relationship with Hashem and the world. Uh -huh. Uncharted realms of our relationship with Hashem. Well, that sounds quite exciting. So this is a good, a good Hasidic life. Um, so he, so the bottom paragraph with the best of inten inten intentions. Jay has stifled an aspect of his personality, which is now crying out for attention. Because that part of being inspired and spontaneous has to be part of our Yiddishkeit. It's crying out. If the soul is not given what it needs in a wholesome, holy context, context it will produce urges to obtain it in other contexts. So we want, we have to make Yiddishkeit exciting. Baruch Hashem, as we are writing it in this present chapter in Jewish history, that in itself is very exciting. Right? Right. Okay, so what's going to happen to Jay? Mayor, Mayor, please don't do that. No. For a moment, we only have a few more minutes. By, not, by denying himself a constructive outlet for his legitimate urge for stimulation, Jay has forced this urge to serve her in more destructive ways. A legitimate urge for stimulation has to come from Yiddishkeit, from, from Jewish sources. This is what we have to offer ourselves, offer our children. Yes. So um, let's see. The solution here would be, for, so it's talking about this particular thing of what he can do, what he can do to follow the trail his divine soul wishes to lead him on from time to time. So there has to be that spontaneous excitement in our Yiddish play along with our discipline. We should just love doing chitas, right? Right, let's make a l'chaim Hashem should empower us that we love doing chitas. L'chaim, l'chaim. That's a good l'chaim. Okay, we just have a few more minutes. Top of page 80. Alternatively, since Hashem is the ultimate source of all true life and pleasure, we have mistaken evil for holiness and have been lured into believing that pursuing a path forbidden by Hashem will lead us to him. Lured into believing that pursuing a path forbidden by Hashem will lead us to him. And people, people make this mistake. I mean, this caused so much in more difficult chapters in Jewish history. There's the whole story of Shabtai Tzvi. He believed that pursuing a path forbidden by Hashem would lead him to Hashem. And just the suffering of the Jewish people that, that was economic collapse and disappointment and despair. So on a smaller level, 
We have to make sure that we're not lured into believing that pursuing a path forbidden by Hashem will lead us to Him. Right? Right. Here, the promise of Hashem in the transgression dupes us into committing it. Very interesting idea. That's how, how do we get duped in, into committing transgressions? Because the promise of Hashem and the transgression, again, lured into belief that pursuing a path forbidden by Hashem will lead us to him. The evil inclination plays on our innate desire to know Hashem in the fullest possible way. The context of the ploy is indeed evil but the kernel of it is the spark of holiness trapped within the forbidden act. The spark of holiness trapped within the forbidden act. So again, it's looking, you know, I remember when I first learned way back in 770 in a class with Y.Y. Jacobson, the idea that every thought, since Ain Od Malvado, and again, this is a theme that we always come back to, there's nothing but Hashem, we spoke last time that our feeling of Hashem's presence, our awe in Hashem's presence is directly correlated with how much we believe ain't owed Movado, that there's nothing besides him. And so, so this idea of ain't owed Movado, that even in every thought, in every, every thought, even if it's very concealed, Hashem is in that thought. Like Hashem, if we look, Hashem is empowering that thought, Hashem is everywhere. Hashem is in the ego. The Rebbe once spoke at a Fabring and how Hashem Atzmos could be found in the ego itself. Who would think to look there in the ego to find Atzmos? That would be the last place I would think to look. The Rebbe spoke at a Fabring. And so the idea of Hashem being in every thought to find those, the, the spark of holiness trapped within the, the forbidden action, thought, or speech because it's there. So there's a lot of, this is, this is a lot of very deep ideas in here to think about for, for next time. So, so what we did today in, in quick, just to, to sum it up. So we spoke about turning from evil and doing good, the three levels of turning from, of evil, from evil and doing good. The first level is depart from evil, focus on depart from evil before doing good. Hachna'a. And the Havdalah was depart from evil by ignoring it and doing additional good. And the sweetening, of course, is depart from evil by making it good, using it for good things, using it for good things. And you see people that have done this, that have, they've taken things that have embittered their lives, painful things, and they've used it to bring tremendous good into the world, using the evil to do good. So uh, we did that, and then we started this chapter, Unmasking the Illusion. And that's what we're, so this is where we'll stop for today, and we'll continue with this at Merz Hashem next week when we're getting very co close to Kislev, right? This coming Shabbos is Shabbos Mavorch in Kislev. It's hard to believe. But thank you all for coming, for joining. We have 35 lovely people joined together. 